team and our leadership team. So um, it's really great to have Ashley here. Now that seems so long ago, Trisha, that I know. <laughs> you wanted a sponsor to see Sweet Network back when we were just maybe a year or two old. <laughs> so true, yeah. I actually met um, one, of the, one of the other first sponsors of um, or early C Suite Network sponsors was a, gym, a man named um, Jim McNamara. And uh, he was with Verizon. And I got to meet him in person last night for the first time here in New York. And uh, he's just fantastic. I don't know if you've worked with him, Ashley, but um, he's doing a lot of different things. He had tremendous experience in the telecom industry, obviously. And, uh, and now he's um, doing his own thing. And I think he's going to come into the Zero Five and so on. So cool. we'll make maybe one more minute and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Oh, there's Pete. Hi, Pete. And Ahmad. Hey, I wasn't hey. sure if I was supposed to announce myself. Thank of course. You. It's so nice to see you there, Pete. We can't see your picture, but we can see your name. Do you have video today? I'm, I'm actually driving using the very sexy Zoom app. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. And James and Ahmad are here as well. I got to see Ahmad last night in New York, and James I saw two weeks ago in Boston. We've been on the road a great deal. Sorry okay. I missed you guys yesterday. I wish I could have been there. Uh, uh, I'm here. Yeah, it was nice meeting you again. Uh, but I'm on, I'm on mute so that I don't have background noise. But nice okay. meeting everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, so it's 2 of 5. So uh, I'd like to get started. And we have been recording, but obviously we will not have <laughs> my hellos and so on in the beginning. Um, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, this is one of our Hero Club digital meetings, and we're really excited about the different ways that we're thinking about how we use the content and the opportunities that we have together. And so for this meeting, what we wanted to do is very, a very similar approach to our, our digital meeting uh, format that we've used in the past, but really open it up to a conversation that uh, nobody has the answers. Um, we have some interesting perspectives and um, and obviously a common interest in terms of uh, what does the economy look like and what can we be anticipating. And at the end of the day, as business owners, how do we best prepare and, and really think to how we have our businesses set to ride out um, whatever the economy deals with. So, you know, whether that is a recession or when there's a recession, um, and, and all the other volatility that we have in our marketplace, um, whether that's digital disruption or, um, or uh, co new competition uh, or other disruptors in, in terms of our businesses. So um, I'm really excited to get this conversation going. Eric Christofferson, uh, obviously, is one of our uh, long-term Hero Club members and um, has just been a phenomenal contributor to all things kind of money-related when it comes to uh, Hero Club and our leaders. And so um, Eric is going to kind of share with me a little back-and-forth conversation. Um, but what we want to do is really just open it up because there, there is no necessarily uh, right answer. And, um, and this is something that we shouldn't be just thinking about when journalists are going crazy saying there's a recession uh, that might happen tomorrow. So, um, so what I'd like to do is just really get started with, Eric, do you mind, everybody knows I do not like bios and I will not read one. Um, uh, my general approach is if somebody doesn't understand that anyone we have speak within the Hero Club is absolutely phenomenal and brings uh, tremendous expertise and heart and soul to their business and their and the expertise they're sharing. And there, there's really not much we can do to help them. Um, and that's not who we have here. So, um, so Eric will kind of get us started in terms of his general thinking about everything we're seeing in the news about a potential recession um, and share a little bit about his background and experience and and why his perspective his perspective has been shaped the way it has. Been. Sound good, Eric? Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think for the bulk of this call, I'll give you a, a couple, and, and I think most people may be getting from the press some of the news highlights when it comes to talk of a recession. But I think I, I'm going to preface this by saying two really important points. One, and we don't know that we're in a recession until we're eight months into a recession. 
So you have to have two consecutive quarters of negative growth. And then usually that data doesn't come out till 30 days or 60 days later. So you only know you're in a recession after we're in a recession, and that's a full market recession. So the you, you don't want to wait until you read or, or hear on TV or, or, or listen to a podcast that someone tells you that. And in fact, you will know for your business usually well in advance. And the reality is that different sectors will experience a recession more severe or less severe than what a general market recession is. So the, the first piece of advice I would tell you is you should be looking at the sector your business is in and trying to look for signs that um, may indicate that growth is or investing, depending upon how they do it, is slowing. And, and that can be in the form of, um, and this will be some of the things to prepare yourselves for, but where you see sales cycles getting longer, you see that people are asking normally, you know, normally customers that you would have thought are asking for better price or, or better financing terms, um, or that the volume of which they're buying is shrinking or altogether you're, you're seeing them stopping and, um, or that you're starting to, um, see that industries related to you or, 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 or behavior of a business that later, you know, you could sit there and say a large business is not purchasing any more of some, uh, of some big ticket item that you are part of that ticket item. So while you're not yet seeing the slowdown because you are a component in something bigger or you are part of a service offering because they're still building those inventories they haven't started to do it you can look for signs like that so the number one thing is re that just realize that you need to look for those signs it is how it affects your sector your industry is going to be more or less severe than what a general market recession is the the general reason why people are concerned about a recession are twofold. One is just we've been in a uh, growth bull market now for the longest time in modern day history. So it is, it is you know, depending upon your sector, it started somewhere as early as 08 and somewhere as late as 2012. And in terms of the, the the financial markets, we've never had this long of a bull market. It's not been a screaming uh, market. It has been an incremental one, and there has been a few moments of volatility. But when it comes to the GDP growth, it has just been growing in a slow but gradual basis. And finally, we're starting to see some evidence of wages catching up. And so there is some indication that the entry-level worker and sort of the middle class is starting finally to catch up to, believe it or not, 2007 levels, <laughs> wow. um, which is crazy, which, by the way, 2000 level is, is not far up where they were in 99, 2000 before the tech bubble burst. So essentially, earnings of consumers, to the extent your business is tied to consumers, you haven't seen much headway in 19 years, but they're finally back at sort of that par position. Um, and I think that the other thing that if you look at what, what there, the reality is, is that a lot of recessions are triggered by one event that then creates a um, herd mentality into a lot of other areas. So what are some of the things right now that people are worried about? They are worried, obviously, uh, their geopolitical worries that are tied to what could be going on in the trade wars, so around tariffs, that the slowdown that that's causing, um, it, which, by the way, is affecting both China and the U.S. There, there's a piece today in the Wall Street Journal about um, the shortage of pigs in China and the, the problem that's causing in prices rising in China. So it's not just specific to the U.S. There is a concern with the level of debt a number of countries have taken around the world, um, not, not the United States, but a lot of others, and that if they start getting into 
um, a situation where there is uh, payment delays or defaults on some of that debt that could trigger something. And then there's a general concern that the um, that a lot of the equity markets are priced um, near their historic highs, or I, I always say in the upper third quadrant. Um, but conversely, you have a situation in America where unemployment is is very low. It's close to sort of where you have a fully engaged workforce, those that are looking for work. Um, as I said, you're starting to see some wage um, gains on behalf of the workers. And the um, level of corporate debt in America compared to what it was in 2006, seven is reasonable. Although right now there is a, um, a rush for companies to take on more corporate debt because it is such reasonable terms. Interest rates are so low. Um, which, just as a side note, you, you know, to the extent you want to get credit, um, some kind of either a, 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 a fixed loan or a line of credit, um, recognizing line of credits can be changed, but a fixed loan now is not a bad time, but I would consider possibly using a lot of that in, in a more dry powder or for really investing in your business to prepare for what happens if there's a slowdown. But don't take on more debt than you think you could carry if your business slowed down. So bottom line on sort of are we headed towards a recession? No one can tell you for certain. Um, there were people who've been predicting that we are going to have a recession three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. But I think it's prudent. Somebody's going to get it right, Eric. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's prudent for you to look, to try to identify what might be the signs for your sector um, that might indicate that your sector is slowing down. And then to realize that when when other sectors or the general market is in a, uh, recession that that will trigger a whole bunch of behavior that may accelerate um, the adverse effects of people spending less, credit getting tighter, um, uh, and you know uh, banks being less considerate on being flexible about outstanding loans, as well as um, that you and, and it may be not only it may be hard to get new new loans or credit and that you may see that for the first time in a long time government may not be able to be the fiscal stimulus and i think that's the last point i would add that basically you the economy is driven by three spending so it's the spending of consumers which is about two-thirds then it's spending of business and it's the spending of government and in the 2008 great recession the united states government was in a position that as consumer spending was pulled back and government uh, business investment pulled back, that the government was able to step in and um, run some, basically make up some of the gap by um, by allowing uh, by their investing and by their spending. But going into a new recession right now, because of the latest tax reform um, and because of the increased deficit in debts. Uh, the United States government is not in a position to necessarily, unless they, they there, there's political support to, to dramatically um, increase deficits and debt. And then the Federal Reserve doesn't have the interest rate mechanism they normally have to be able to um, try to make credit more affordable and easier. So I, other than taking some questions on that, where I'm prepared to help you is I have sort of seven things that I think businesses can do, not in any priority on how to on how to prepare and, and for what how to operate your business when your sector is experiencing some form of a recession. I love, I love that, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so so real recognizing that the United States and the Federal Reserve are are sort of almost out of bags of tricks that we're aware of as, as lay people, the, the, the interest rates are as kind of as low as you can go. The debt and deficits are at astronomical proportions. Does that mean that the entire world has basically reached the end of the line of governmental intervention in the guiding of the, 
macro economies of the world? Like, are, is this it? Are we at the end of our rope forever? <laughs> well, I, I think forever is <laughs> way too long of a time horizon. If forever means it here. <laughs> and forever for some people might be a couple years and others it could be decades. Um, well, but in other words, like if the government debt never gets paid down, it just always yeah. keeps going up and deficits just always go up. I mean, like they're, when, you know, they're never going to just go into reverse. And then how, if even if they magically were to go in reverse, like how do you, it take a while to undo years of damage. You know? Yeah, you do. I mean, you can look at countries such as Argentine, Team, Argentina, yeah. Yeah. as an example. Uh, yeah, that that you if you exasperate it, then you got to hope that the other nations are willing to do some kind of renegotiate that mm -hmm. debt, either that they forgive, as Madeline has pointed out, certain, or whether they go interest only, or whether they make it be a lower interest rate or some combination thereof. But the reality is the United States, believe it or not, despite our great debt and large deficit is still in financially better shape than most of the other nations out there. But Eric, we are- uh, so, Sorry, I'm, I just, uh, I just wanted here. to- uh, Go ahead. Oh, yeah, Eric, I just wanted to dig in to what you were saying about the interest rates. So if you look at most of the areas of the Eurozone, <laughs> uh, their primary is it has a negative and that sort of thing. And we're sitting here today at five and a quarter percent with this unspoken rule that five percent equals zero. I'm curious as to why, I mean, it sounds to me like you buy into that line of thinking. Um, I, I'm curious as to why that is, because it seems to me to promote inflation when we have other things that are saying there is no inflation, the wage inflation is not uh, coming in. And so it's probably an unfair question to ask you, uh, because I do think that, that, that we'll have some contraction in the next 24 months. I just can't figure out why. Well, I mean, and that, I mean, part, honestly, part of it is going to be that, that it's going to be that emotional, psychological response by consumers and businesses. So as an example, businesses as a whole for the last five years have not been investing right. in this, in this yes. market the way That's they have in other growth mm -hmm. markets because they've been nervous. So if they had really been investing in, in long-term um, capital things, you could argue they could have helped uh, improve the fundamentals. And, and you, you see the market thing about consumer sentiment. Once you start to see that if, there, if, if any jobs, you know, we already saw a contraction in the number of new jobs for the latest monthly figure. And by the way, a whole bunch of those jobs were temporary jobs, even related to the, the census coming up. Yeah. So you have to dive into that, but was, I think it was only 133,000 jobs. Then consumers start to get a little more nervous and they'll look at things that they can postpone. So one of the first areas in a recession, if your business is a tied to a service or a product that is not part of their daily or, or monthly living needs, i.e. it can be postponed, then you are more vulnerable to someone say that is, you know, I need to get my haircut and I got to get my haircut. Um, you know, maybe I don't do it every four weeks in my case, maybe I do it every six weeks, but I'm, I'm not going to wait a year or three months. So I'm still going to put milk and bread and food. Um, I'm still going to do my laundry I'm st and things like that. So I think that you, you need to look at the, you know, what, what I will tell you is you're going into recession. You've got to sharpen your prop, your value proposition so that people can say, look, I used to have X amount of dollars so I could buy you know, I could invest or consume 10 things. Now I have Y less. And so now I, maybe I can only do six things. So now you need to make, you have to be one of the six instead of one of the 10. And if you think you're on the periphery, you're going to need to sharpen your value statement of why 
they should be spending the money on your service or product, um, then maybe you ha you've had to do when there was more funds to spend or use for investing. Eric, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the perception, and I think it's just fascinating. I, you know, I spent 20 years in market research, and a great deal of the work I did was in public affairs and perception and perception of the economy, et cetera. And, um, and I was in a, a senior director in a $20 billion company during the last recession. And in Canada, if you look at it, we really did not have a very difficult time. Uh, if you just look at the financials in hindsight, but experiencing it, it was incredibly painful. And everybody, not just the public, <laughs> but the business leader, the bu business leaders, the business community, were reacting as if it were a recession, um, and and one that could, you know, become uh, go straight into depression. And so um, it was a very challenging time, and a great deal of it based on perception. And I'm just kind of thinking through what that meant and what that meant for us as business leaders and keeping our businesses successful. Um, and, then, and then also kind of tying that into the study that, uh, that we talked about where the top 200 CEOs in America said, wait a second, it's not just about shareholder value, which sort of gives that, that whole concept of the notion that, that we're about more than just quarterly results reporting. And I'm just wondering, based on everything we've just talked about, how that's shaping your perception of how well will we be armed from a business community or business leadership perception perspective now when we have that kind of leadership coming to the front? Well, I think, so, I mean, I think there, there were two questions, but I'll try to integrate the two and, and make it specific to a business. Mm -hmm. You know, my opinion, as you're heading into a recession, if you have a good plan, you get opportunities with your staff, with your, your, your supply or business partners, and with your customers that are unlike any other time in an economic cycle. So despite the fact that it is scary, if you're actually developing some kind of a, of a plan for a slowdown, um, whether it's a mild recession or something bigger, and again, it's gonna be largely specific to your sector and the community in which you reside. Um, and so those businesses that are prepared are going to find some amazing things. So just to go through a couple, yeah. let's start with that um, belief, you know, this may seem so obvious and yet it's not done. Keeping your staff, at least the ones that you think are really good, becomes one of the most important things in a recession. So if you were to take your financial budget and you're like, whatever percent it is, 100% or something less, we need to keep them. And you're like, okay, we have to find a way, even if we're not making a profit, that we can continue to pay those payroll costs, is going to reward you in ways you will never understand till later on. But the simple ways to understand it is, loyalty is gonna go up, they're gonna be more committed to really working hard, even, and even though they know this is a difficult time, and you avoid, when you get into that next growth cycle, having to spend all the time trying to go find new talent and then train it. So that becomes a great opportunity where people are like, yeah, that company laid off 10%, that company laid off 15 or or furloughed so many people. And those, you know, it was it was, it was obvious those that we were keepers that we that they stuck with us but it, it raises another interesting thing now is not a bad time that if you have employees that are not a good fit or not performing well to let them go because it is low unemployment and you are really getting your ship ready for these um th these more volatile times so you want to really identify who is the key staff, who are those keepers, those people you want for the long term, and be ready financially to be able to sustain the costs associated with keeping them. Um, I think that the second thing is you can look at your customers and what you need to do for that is you should be prepared, and this is one of the classic mistakes banks do, um, which is you should, already now understand which customers are likely are, are on the edge 
that if things slow down for them, they wouldn't be able to make the same level of purchases or volume purchases, or they wouldn't be able, if they have any kind of leasing or financing, be able to, to meet all that, or if there's any debt involved, they may not be able to make principal payments. And say, of that group, which ones, and ideally it's a larger number, do we want to keep? And so we're prepared to, that when, it, when we need to, to offer more flexible terms. Again, those customers are going to be some of your biggest advocates and, re and referral partners because they're going to be the ones that go, you know what? They were prepared when we came and said, we can't do 100%. Um, and they helped me, they helped us out. And that may be even, you know, consignment of some products or letting some services not get paid 100% in advance. And you will take some risk. And so you will need to manage that, but you want to identify who might be those customers that will need some special considerations. And then you want to, you want to be ready, your financial model ready to be able to sustain them. And that will be another way that you will weather whatever recession for your business and your community in a way that you will rise up way above everyone else. And then the third interesting area is going to be in recessions is a time when you can win market share. So in a, it really is two things that if you know that your product or service is still going to be in demand, then you um, versus that, that you know, it, it, it completely dries up. You want to find ways in which you can offer more flexible terms. So if you don't think that, the, that you have the benefits that you are bringing to those customers are the kinds of benefits that make people go, we have to have this because those benefits are so material to us just um, making it, surviving, uh, succeeding, then you need, may need to find ways in which you are, you're prepared to be a little more flexible in some of the terms, whether it's price, whether it's uh, the, 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 the payment um, terms, is it net 30, net 60, net 90? Um, whether you say, you know what, we'll let you build up a little bit of outstanding payable so that um, they can get those products and services so that they continue to be in a position to do business. You're helping your community then, or the communities those, those new customers are in continue to thrive and you're winning market share and again you're making them be um you're 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 gaining new customers that as the market and and your sector comes back into a growth period that they're going to be buying more of and they'll be referring now what that means is that you're going to need to really identify who in your organization can try to identify the risk factors for all three so with staff, um, you know, one, you need to try to understand which staff you really want to keep for the long term, and then how to think about um, what to do with those that may not be the ones to keep, and you didn't want to let them go now. You were waiting until you had a reason, and I would say, no, now's the time to do it, because they have a better chance of finding jobs elsewhere than do it when you get into a recession. When it comes to your existing customers, be able to identify now, think about what is the criteria to identify those that may need help and what is the kind of help. And then conversely, really look at your value proposition and what will, you know, how you'll be able when everyone is really um, more worried about getting revenues, how you're going to compete. So what, what can you do to sharpen your value proposition and provide more flexible terms? So, who are the resources in your company that can do that? And putting all three in place is are three real concrete ways. I have a couple other things I can talk to you about, but those are three things that get to how are you looking at long-term uh, welfare of your company and the impact it has on your community and, and people out there. I love the fact that there's the immediate uh, value of what you're suggesting, Eric, in terms of it helps our business today no matter what happens. And when you look at market share and the ability to win market share, you don't even necessarily have to be creating different terms or lowering your price 
if you are so valuable as to be a solution provider when people are in crisis. Um, well, so the group that I built, we didn't lower our value. And in fact, we grew 20% year over year during the recession because we were somebody they could trust to go to to help them because they didn't know what to do to communicate to their customers and clients and so on. Well, and you, you raise a great point. A lot of times you, the, the CEO, the executive in your company, if you could go out on every sales call, you would have no problem making sure that the benefits, the value proposition of your service or product is there. But the reality is that very often your business is you're relying on others and they're not as good at it as you are. And so really spending the time with your staff to make sure that you understand um, where you're winning, that they're emphasizing the right things and where you're losing, that it isn't because they didn't really see how much better your value was and, and, it, and, and the good fit it was with what they are. But no matter what, you need to really look at your business and say, is it something that are the purchases of your services or products, things that are postponable? They are not core to that business or that consumer, or is it core to them? In which case you just need to make sure you're beating your competition. Yeah. So, okay. So there's so many things that I know lots of people are going to want to jump in with questions, but also I'd love for people to share what's happening in their industry, what they're seeing and, and so on. Um, Jeff Barnes, I'm going to come up to you. Then I've got Chris and let me know who else wants to be jumping in and we'll, we'll uh, make sure we come out to you. So Jeff, you're on um, mute right now, but if you want to jump in in terms of your perspective from, you know, angel investors perspective and, and the companies, the entrepreneurs that you're working with, that'd be awesome. Can we get Jeff off of you? There we go. Can you hear me now? We can, Jeff, yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, so, I mean, first off, whatever Eric great, gave was great. And I would say that um, the, the first thing is that when the, the mainstream media and everybody starts talking about a recession, that's when you know it's too late to start making all these changes he mentioned. So uh, his point about, you know, cutting the, check, the chaff, so to speak, early, and hard is something that will really benefit you because fortunes are made during recessions, right? Investing in companies is the highest. When we see a recession, we see a company that is doing well, or at least has a strong value proposition, like Eric mentioned, that we know will sustain a recession. The, the other key uh, point that you guys are all on this call for is the executive team, the leadership is what really drives the growth of that company coming, going through or out of a recession. If you don't have a strong leadership team and a strong value proposition in place, then never mind, it's game over, might as well roll it up right now. But what I would like to, to add into that as well is that you, you really want to get not only great and very clear on your value proposition and internally clear on your vision, your mission statement with your team so they know what the purpose is of your business, but really start looking at your marketing because the number one thing that people cut, that every business owner across the board tends to cut in, when it comes to budget is their sales and marketing. And it's so counterintuitive, but they look at it as, okay, well, we need to cut back and marketing is one of our biggest expenses and, you know, we're paying our salespeople high commissions and whatnot. And so they think that's going to be the, the easiest place to cut money. But the problem is when you do that, of course, you're cutting the message out into the market that lets you know that you let them know that you still exist and that you're a great company to do business with. So in addition to strengthening your value proposition and finding out new ways to add value to your customers, really focus on your marketing and how clear you are and how consistent you are in your messaging and your offers and so on. And the, the other key point that I would want to make about that is focus on your existing customers, your existing clients. Eric, Eric did hit um, in on this, but the better you are at serving your existing customers, your long-term customers and clients, you know, that, that 20% that drives 80% of your revenue, the better you will be long-term. And also, when you start doing that and you start, you know, queuing up these great clients and they start generating referrals because they know you're going to stick around, you're, you're going to keep offering them great deals throughout a recession. Um, it, it gets your business ready and in the mode that even if a recession does not occur or doesn't go as deep as we might think, your business is still much stronger coming out of it. And from my perspective, when we're investing in companies, we invest in early stage companies. We look at a lot of early stage companies. So they, they may or may not even make it through a tiny little dip. But what we really look for is that strong management team with a strong value proposition that has a strong marketing angle. So we know they have a go-to market strategy. They can get out there and get in front of their clients. 
And when I say we're looking at early stage or private companies, that doesn't mean that they're brand new. It means they could be in business for five years, but now they're ready to go to that next stage. Well, we want to make sure that they have a really good value proposition and they know how to articulate that. Right? Because if you don't let the world know that you exist and how great you are, no one's going to come knocking at your door. And the best thing to do is start strengthening that now so that when your competitors start going under or start having to go to the loan and get out lines of credit, you guys are in a cash rich position. So it's not going to affect you as much, if at all, because now you can start buying their clients because you're sticking around, you're, you're staying in business, you're spending your money on marketing, you're strengthening that value proposition and that relationship with your customers. And as a result, they're going to flock to you when they leave the competitor. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, you know, uh, I, I, there's so many conversations I want to have here. I did promise we'd go to Chris. Is there anyone who wants to address specifically what Jeff was just talking about? I don't, I don't want to... Uh, um, yeah, well, I'm not here, not necessarily Jeff, but uh, the whole topic, you know, as, as Eric has did a great job of talking about, uh, there is a detail about the inverted yield curve and when Pete and Eric talked about the end of the rope, there is talk that I hear more, we work in FinTech ourselves with large investment banks, of the negative rate. So when uh, Trey said that 5% is zero, the negative rate exists in other countries, but they might come to the U.S. Eric, what do you think about that? Or what's your perspective or the team? Is that something you're aware of? And, you know, what's your response to it? I'll be interested in knowing that. Whether the yeah, I mean, federal... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I, I think right now the early indications or the, the current market view in the U.S. is we won't go to negative rates because we don't need to. Um, but I think that the the re i mean why do we have negative rates in europe it's because people think that that is a more secure place for them to try to preserve their assets than the alternatives and so the reality is the way the markets are going to work is that if you don't need to give a hundred percent back you can pay 98 percent back and people are saying you know what, I'll accept a 2% loss because this is really my cash. So they're not long-term investments. Most of those are liquid assets where they're trying to find something that could at least pay par or zero and ideally pay one, two, three, four percent. Um, so I don't see the U.S. going to negative right now. Um, but I think the, the re, this is where I, I always get a little nervous about the speculation out there that if you're, you're a business out there, I think the most important thing is one, you've got great financial terms now. So if you don't have a lot of debt um, and you think it's, it's responsible to take on a little more and, and you really can use it as more dry powder, it, it's not a bad time to do that. Um, but to understand the consumer or the institutional sentiment, it's people are saying we need a portion of our portfolio that we need to make sure is liquid, i.e. in the equivalent of a cash. And we think right now, if we just put it in cash, that the currency is going to lose more value than what these banks are offering, or the, which is saying that we guarantee we'll pay you 98% of your money back a year from now. So that's what what is driving those kinds of investments but if you look right now in the US there's a whole bunch of corporations issuing corporate debt and there seems to be a demand for it because as someone else said earlier today the fundamentals in the US still are strong and so a lot of people are saying yeah I'll own Apple debt Apple's issuing a whole bunch of debt because I don't think they're gonna go bankrupt and so I feel comfortable getting even if it's a small return. I, I, I haven't looked at the corporate paper right today to see where it is, but to get something better than I would get than owning treasury bills. And I'm okay with that incremental risk. Um, but I, today I wasn't so much focusing on where do you put your money or what's going to happen with investments, but that's, uh, I guess, a long answer to your question. No, I mean, so can I piggyback off of that? So basically, because we think that the U.S. is going to be a little bit better, maybe with this isolationist, policy of Trump, 
I posit, or uh, tell me what you think about the statement that we will weather this much better than the global recession, and if any, and uh, although there might be some corrections, it's not as bleak as people think it is if your business is all focused on U.S. customers. If you're multinational, then it might be something else. I'm, I'm yeah, not I mean, making, the, uh, yeah, what the, do you think the about only, that statement? I mean, and, and again, the, the, these are where we can get into a lot of pontification, but here's what I will right. tell you and, and that I think is important. Very often when things start to correct, there's a domino effect. And so you might say all my customers are U.S. consumers, but you may realize that those U.S. consumers have jobs in companies that have international business. And then they either get laid off or they get now reduced to 80% pay, or they're not getting any increase, and their debt is pre preventing them, and you're on the cusp of what they need to buy. It becomes a domino effect. Plus, if you have Argentina falls short, then something happens um, with China slowing down in growth, and then you start to see something happening with Greece or Italy, then you just get a market sentiment where people start getting nervous. And even if it doesn't affect your paycheck in your business or your home, you start, everyone starts to get nervous. And so everyone contracts and everyone pulls back. So the main thing that I tell people when it comes to running their business is look for the signs within your sector, understand the relation of your customers to sort of their, you know, what business are they in or how are those consumers, what kind of jobs, what kind of um, geographic in, uh, places are they so that you, you, are, you, you are thinking out one, two, three points out um, for what would be indications that it's going to um, put more pressure or adversely impact your industry, your sector. That's the best way to do this. Yeah, I want to make sure uh, we have time for Chris to have a question and maybe maybe one or two more. So let me know if you have another question, anyone. Um, but Chris, if you want to jump in, that'd be great. Yeah, just a, a couple quick comments. Uh, I won't take up much time. I watch the auto industry very closely just because it's near and dear to my heart. There's a long backstory there. Um, two things caught my attention. Um, one very recently, like yesterday, and the other was... About six months ago, there was um, a report on car payments going bad. And that to me is like the bellwether indicator because people will quite literally pay their car payments and, and push their rent and push their other stuff because they can't get to work um, in most cases without their car. So there was a huge spike in um, default, car loan defaults a few months ago. So that's one. Um, I do agree that once the news starts talking about recession, it's already underway or the threat is like really high. So this was probably three or four months. So I watched that and then Ford got downgraded to junk yesterday. Um, that didn't, based on my memory, that didn't even happen last time. Uh, Ford was kind of the darling of the crash of uh, 2008, 2009. So um, I'm hopelessly optimistic, but the lights are definitely flashing yellow from what I can see. Um, Tesla's a bubble. I don't think you can make any other case. So the car business is Tesla and Ford. Ford is junk. Tesla's a bubble. Um, that doesn't tell a very good story. So that's kind of the general read on the, what I, where I think the economy is. I think it's right on the knife's edge. And emotion drives everything. So being out here in California... My partner, Ace, opening up a studio, film studio, actually working on that now for the first time. This is a recession thing because the real estate market, which was really, really strong here in Los Angeles, has gotten softer. And he's been able to suddenly find a place to, lo to, to put his studio, his physical studio, expand his studio, actually. And so w watch emotion. Um, people high. The money is going to follow the emotional um, moods of people in the economy. So as as it gets uh, slows down, movies go up. Sports tends to go up, not necessarily games in the stadiums, but ticket, um, you know, subscriptions, online subscriptions. So I guess in summary, um, autos is a huge bellwether. I've been watching it for a long time. It tells a very, a very scary story at the moment. 
and uh, and I'm not a negative person at all, um, but it's just, it's in your face. You got to look at it and then watch emotion, the flow of emotions. And, you know, these crashes can come suddenly. You can be looking at all these numbers and then I was, <laughs> I was swept into the last one and, and, and it, you know, it was day by day, like watching your house burn to the ground. So I would be very careful. You know, we tend to forget things. <laughs> um, that Please. can happen again. And no, I'm done. I think, thank you very much. No, so I think, I mean, you raised, Chris, some really good points. Um, I'll, I'll comment on the car industry in the, in the moment. But I think the most important thing, if you ever know you're going into a slower period or recession, building up operating reserves, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a business, or whether you're a household, where you have that, what, you know, what also is known as a rainy day fund, so that you can carry your business, you, you can, if, if the income that you're bringing into your household or to your business is not covering everything, you have the ability to tap those reserves and to help you get by, whether that's to keep staff, whether that's to continue to purchase inventory or to continue with some R&D. So you should be looking very, very clearly at your operating reserves, seeing whether they're adequate enough. The longest recession, this is what people often forget, typically recessions, and remember, you don't know your recession until eight or nine months, typically recessions never last more than two to three years. So, even the Great Recession itself did not last more than two and a half years. Not that every sector rebounded on the same day, but in the, in the typical bull market or, or growth market is lasting on the short four or five, and in this case, it's 10 plus. So you need to look at your financials in such a way that you're like, do we have enough operating reserves? Do we have enough access to liquid assets? So not um, e-liquid that could be things in real estate or in private equity or things like that you couldn't sell so that you can get by. The longest you should probably need to worry about is three years and the shortest is probably a year. And then you raise another point that during this period is when you see things and if you take the car analogy where Tesla might get purchased for an extraordinary price because Tesla has a lot of good technology and they've got some good market share in the electric car space. So to the extent you can build up dry powder, either to acquire companies or to make investments in growing your own capacity of your service or your things, there will be some big opportunities where things are at a much lower price and you will be able to take advantage of things at a much lower price. So those are two things to consider. Yeah, fantastic. Eric, can I ask a follow up on that? Let's make it quick, yeah. and then that'd be great. So, and do we'll I go to James? Uh, okay, sorry oh, yeah. if I'm interrupting someone. Shut me up if I am. Okay. Um, so, do I hear you say that we should we should bank two to three years of operating reserves, or is the formula a bit more nuanced than that? So, in other words, if I think I that think you know, the I think recession it's... hits us at thirty percent, should I bank seventy percent times two years? And then just as a general question to the group, I'm curious as to how much cash in terms of months people typically keep on hand. Yeah, and there are two, there are two kinds. I'll answer the first question. There are two kinds of cash. There's those where you have a line of credit set up, which can be taken away. And you're suddenly like, oh, I'm all set. I have, a, I have X million or X hundred thousand line of credit from my bank. And then there's some covenant in that you forgot and you don't you're not meeting that covenant or that term that that ratio and they're saying i'm so sorry or the bank itself just gets in a bind they're like you can't extend that line of credit and then there's the cash right. that you actually have like you know it's either in some kind of money market uh t-bills or just cash I, the, the main thing i think you need to think about is how is your industry going to perform in a contraction so there used to be a thing that said you know, shoe repair, haircuts, and funeral homes are all do great in a recession because people still keep dying. People are more likely to take care of their shoes than buy new shoes. And people still are going to um, focus on grooming uh, men and women alike. And so you need to think about in the, how, what is the cyclicality of my business in the event that there is some kind of a narrower, broader recession? And then you need to think about 
how much when it comes to reserves are are you trying to do to cover just break even which may be a certain number and then versus no we want to have a higher reserve so we could continue to win market share possibly and do some capital investment at much better terms or you know maybe it's it's building out a factory and for the first time the labor and materials are available at affordable prices so i think you need to look at each each of the you need to do it i when it comes to saying three years of cash operating reserves i i'm not going to tell you that because one i don't know if that's reasonable to even get to and i would need to look at your specific situation all i was saying is that typically a recession lasts two to three years and you when you it's formally announced you're already the earliest is six months in and typically you know eight or nine months into it when it's official Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay, so I promised two people that they could get to share a comment and ask a question. So if we can keep this nice and tight, James, if you want to jump in, and then we have uh, MJ and Eddie are going to give us a little synopsis on what they're seeing in the real estate industry. Um, and then we have to wrap. I'm, I'm now busily thinking, oh my goodness, should we be doing another one of these conversations next week, following up on some other issues that we've started to un unwrap as well. But James, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a comment and a question. I'll, I'll keep it as quick as I can. One is a, sort of a, a micro recession tactic on Eric's comment to finding the right staff and keeping the right people. Uh, I was tasked one time with, you know, find the layoffs. We need to find three, four bodies, just get rid of them. And I proposed to the entire team that I had, rather than do that, why don't we all just take a reduction and work together on this? And immediately one person says, nope, I'm out. So I said, great, you're not a team player. There's one of my bodies. And <laughs> everybody else said, yeah, let's take the reduction. And the yeah. payment back in loyalty over the years is, you know, something worth every penny since then. You know, and things have recovered and everyone's back to where they were. But knowing who the right people were on your team, it was a phenomenal exercise. Agreed. Um, the, the question that I have, and it's something that Jeff was sort of mentioning with, uh, you know, finding the right time to invest. And Chris was talking about the, the emotion of it. Is the point of preparing for a recession, not just to, you know, find the way to go lean a little bit, but also to double down. You know, I, I picture this relating to when stocks, you know, emotionally, people just start selling, 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 and everybody goes into cash. That's when the smart investor would start buying, buying, buying all of these cheaper and cheaper stocks because there'll be a correction. Is it a, a kind of a formula between the two where you want to go lean and start focusing on the right things? You know, Jeff was mentioning, don't cut marketing because this is where you need to go out and say, hey, you're, you're tough. So are we, but we're going to make it work for you. You know, is there a right? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think first you got to make sure your business is going to be viable. So how you get to lean and you make sure you're financially and your human capital is in the best shape and that your relationship with your existing customers, that you're going to be able to keep them, that they're not going to fire you. And you can also help them if they, that you're prepared to help them if they need help. But there is no question, not enough of us are prepared that when you get a correction, prices are so attractive. And suddenly people are saying, I was never for sale, but I'm for sale now. Or you get a, a developer in the real estate who says, no, I never had time. I'm sorry, I've, I've got four houses or four commercial things. I'm, I don't have anything. And then they're like, oh my God, they all fell away. Do you have a project for me? I'll do it. I'll do it at a much lower, you know, instead of whatever it is, plus 10 or 15%, I'll do it at 5% profit. So be, so it's two, I think you're, you've hit it. It's, it's getting lean and, and, and really being sort of securing your business and your partners, I mean, your, your customers and your staff. And then it's saying, do, can we now build up that dry powder um, to really take advantage of opportunities? I love it. Okay. And then so um, MJ and Eddie, do you mind just giving us a 30 second synopsis? And what we're going to do after this session is send out a quick email. I absolutely love the, the, this discussion, and I think all of us want to be jumping in. So we're going to send out a survey, um, just literally two, three questions, and get your feedback. When should we regroup? And what are the topics that have spun out of this conversation so that we make sure we're, we're continuing on uh, this trajectory? So uh, MJ and Eddie, do you want to jump in quickly? Yeah, well, we're, we're in real estate uh, in northern New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan. So 
uh, like like uh, someone else was saying, I mean, it's really what happens is going to be really dependent on your individual sector and in real estate, you know, it's so local, right? So as, um, as um, I think Chris was saying, you know, the market in, in LA has softened. Um, but what's interesting that a lot of people probably don't know and that we're definitely uh, talking to our clients about is that real estate prices nationally actually went up three out of the last five US recessions. So they didn't go down. Most people think recession prices go down. Not that's not what, that's not what the data shows. They actually right. had gone up sixty percent of the time. So while um, it is a, a psych, you know it, it is an emotion and psychological driven market to some degree. Um, you know when it comes to housing, um, and I'm talking about mainly the residential se sector. That's what we're in. People have to live somewhere. And, you know, when people stop, uh, start pulling back from buying, the rental market gets super strong and the rents go up. So it's kind of like this catch 22 where mm -hmm. the rents go up and generally if the market, you know, uh, gets soft, the interest rates are low already. And that, that dynamic where is it better to buy or sell uh, or, or rent, mm -hmm. you know, that, that comes very compelling. So I think that's part of the reason why real estate values, at least in certain, you know, markets right. in the US um, are, are pretty stable. Uh, that's not to say we're not, we're not uh, holding back and starting to uh, acqu acquire cash because there, there's going to be great deals out there for sure yeah. because there's going to be people put in situations where you know, they're going to have to uh, liquidate some assets and you know, we want to be around. That's one thing yeah. we learned from the 2008 market yeah. when the real estate really you know, have the cash ready to be able to make those investments. Uh, and and Barnes and I were just talking about that this morning. Yeah, another thing someone said is, you know, um, you know your, your clients, your current clients and your past clients, that's something we're really focusing on. Yeah. That builds a moat around our business because those are clients that are already done business, love us, like us, and refer that's us out. Well. So real, we're really gonna spend a lot of effort and marketing on that segment because that's, that's the segment that's gonna really help carry us through a slower period. And, and also it just, it just insulates your, our business to some degree from all the external factors that are trying to get into the real estate business to get to that consumer first, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of tech companies that realize there's, there's $90 billion in real estate commissions in the U S alone. And they it's want a piece of that. Huge part of the GDP. But if we are really focused on our past clients and sphere that sort of insulates us again. So those are the few things that I just wanted to We're mention. already under attack. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of the, the three o'clock end for this meeting. Um, Kathy Jo is going to send an email out for us. It's going to have three simple questions. Just um, uh, It's going to ask uh, about next topics, how frequently we should do this, and you know any of the feedback you might have. Um, I, I love this discussion, and I love the idea of how do we integrate a little bit more of everybody's insight, because uh, one of the big things that I learned in the last recession is when you're building off of diversity and in the Hero Club, we're so proud to have the diversity we have and continue to build on our diversity. Um, we have the strength then to, to do things and to create opportunities that others will miss. And so I'm really thrilled. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for participating and engaging this conversation. Um, Eric, thank you for, uh, you know, giving us lots of food for fodder and everyone else. Awesome. Yeah, Natalie's clapping. Have an awesome rest of the day, rest of the week. Can't wait to see you soon. We have the, the um, uh, Crazy Horse event coming up on September 22nd to the 24th. And I, I, all of us are so excited. We can't wait to see you there. It's going to be an incredible experience and lots of great stuff happening while we're there. So, um, yeah, I'll see you soon. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.